Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar for 2018. My name is Karen Wazalenka. I'm the Executive Director of the Saskatchewan Association of Social Workers, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's presentation, Transition Planning for Youth Aging Out of Care. Today's presentation is a collaboration between the Canadian Association of Social Workers, the Saskatchewan Association of Social Workers, and the Saskatchewan First Nations Family and Community Institute. We're excited to be partnering with the ASW and the Institute to provide information on this very important topic. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to point out that all of the housekeeping details that you will need, like how to access our recordings, where to download the slides, and how to get your certificate of attendance are all included in the housekeeping widget that popped up when you first logged on. We will definitely have time for questions and answers at the end, so please do type in your questions as we go throughout the presentation. So with that said, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Shelley Thomas Prokop. Shelley is the Program Director for the Saskatchewan First Nations Family and Community Institute. She has worked in the child and family welfare field for over 20 years and so has a wealth of experience and expertise. In her role with the Institute, she's involved in developing resources and training for First Nations group home staff, prevention workers, First Nations caregivers, and protection staff. Programs are developed using a community-based model that includes those being served in the development of the resources and the training, and we'll hear more about that today. Along with her focus on community-based approaches, Shelley also focuses on process development and ethical practice. And so with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Shelley. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to SASW as well as to Sally for setting up the webinar. And um, welcome, everybody. Greetings from Treaty 6 area in Saskatoon. I'm excited uh, to talk a little bit about a resource that uh, our organization has developed. And, uh, and hopefully by the end have lots of questions to answer. So we'll get started on uh, slide number one. <coughs> our objectives for today are to support the use of innovative tools to engage youth in the field, uh, to share some successful processes of resource development that is community-based and grounded in First Nations values of collaboration. We also want to provide uh, a little bit of training on three different resources. Um, it's all the same resource, but in three different uh, looks. One's the binder, one's the website, and then the third is the app. And of course, our, our goal from the very beginning was to improve documentation and reporting using technology and our work with youth. Outline for today is to tell you a little bit about who I work for, SFN, FCI, uh, the development of the resource process. Then I'll chat a little bit about each of the resources, one, two, and three. Talk a little bit about worker analytics. Uh, some of the practice challenges that we've um, come across in the implementation, and then, of course, a, a Q&A. First of all, who we serve uh, at Saskatchewan First Nations Family and Community Institute is 74 First Nations. Uh, right now in Saskatchewan, there's approximately 1.2 million people, and 15.5% of those are Aboriginal people. We, uh, we look at the statistics from the Ministry of Social Services, and it appears that over 80% of the kids in care are Aboriginal. So um, when our organization is thinking of, you know, how can we help people work with our people, uh, we think of those numbers. Now, our organization opened in 2008, and um, we have a board, um, and our board is made up of um, six child and family service executive directors, as well as representatives from HR, finance, and, and a lawyer. Our core business really is 
uh, research, training, um, doing work in standards, as well as uh, having people come together and work together on different projects. The mission of our organization is to be the leading, innovative, sustainable, holistic center of research and professional learning to organizations serving children, youth, and families. Our mission statement is to build capacity within organizations serving children, youth, and families based on First Nations values. And you'll see that demonstrated uh, when we talk about uh, the youth transitions resource. <clears throat> the seven values that we work towards um, all the time are respect, love, bravery, wisdom, humility, honesty, and truth. And you'll often see those values associated with First Nations people and organizations. So an example of honesty in the work we do is accepting that we have um, a requirement to be transparent and accountable to our members, our communities, our funders, and our stakeholders, and to each other. We also have guiding principles that um, specifically guide, who, guide the work that we do with particular groups. So you can see from the list there's elders, youth, community, members, and other organizations, First Nations government, government, professional organizations, employees, the environment, and funders. So an example of community, of how do we work with community? Well, our, our guiding principle is to increase the capacity of service organizations to improve the lives of First Nations on and off reserves. So that just gives you a bit of an idea of what that looks like. Now, in any kind of resource that we develop here at the Institute, we like to have um, a process. And you can see from this slide that there are six steps, and not all the time are those um, done sequentially. Sometimes we go back and forth and back and forth, and it just depends with the group that we're working with and the projects that we're doing. But you can see that culture is in the middle of all uh, that we do, and that's because we do represent um, our five groups, our five First Nations groups in Saskatchewan. Now, how this particular resource uh, was developed was <coughs> Research was showing that there wasn't a lot of work being done with youth that were aging out of care in our communities. So the frontline workers were talking to us and saying, we need something to support that work that we're doing. So we got a group of people together, and we talked about the current provincial policy, what were the requirements uh, there, and what kind of direction did the policy give us. And it was determined that uh, a resource was needed with some kind of curriculum that would uh, assist a worker in bringing a youth through a number of uh, formation sessions or sharing of information through conversations about aging out of care. So we got a group, um, a working group together, which is very common here at the Institute as our community-based model um, suggests. And we had an elder, a youth, we had caregivers, we had frontline service workers, we had a representative from the Ministry of Social Services, and we also had an INAC rep. We did a knowledge and literature review on the current resources out there for youth aging out of care. We discussed um, multiple times with uh, using um, a focus group approach. We discussed with different youth in the field um, around the province youth that were in care, youth that were in care, um, youth that were in um, certain areas in Saskatchewan where there was a high rate of, of Aboriginal uh, youth going, say, to a high school. We would contact the high school and, and uh, see if we could get a youth group together to discuss, you know, uh, what do they need when they're aging out of care. So we took all this information and we developed an outline. And that outline was very helpful in understanding uh, how, what youth needed. Now we need to determine how to share that kind of information with them. 
So then a framework was developed, and there are some really good resources coming out of Alberta as well as the Casey Foundation that helped us ground some of that information in developing the curriculum. <clears throat> the group knew that they wanted um, something that followed policy, but also it was a flexible resource. It was culturally relevant to them because we have a lot of our youth leaving the rural areas and coming into the urban centers. Um, they wanted something that um, they could understand and easily work through, but the workers wanted something that was a conversation, that it wasn't just a checkbox that said, here, you need to finish this, this, and this, and after you finish these 10 items, you're now uh, qualified to you know, exit care. It, it, it wasn't uh, the intention at the beginning, and it continues to be that this is a youth-led resource um, that concentrates on having conversations with youth about where they want to go and what they may need when they leave care. <clears throat> so the first resource that we developed was in a binder format. <clears throat> and the binder is a couple hundred pages. It had glossy tabs. And um, it had eight sections. So you can see it was housing, wellness, education, finance, relationships, communications, employment, and knowing your rights in the law. <clears throat> so these were, all, these were all areas that were identified as information needing to know as you transition out of care. But as we went through the development, the workers and the youth identified that there's got to be a way to assess what a youth already knows in these areas. <clears throat> so a very uh, um, a two-page assessment tool is at the beginning of each of the sections, and I give a little bit of a clip here at the at the bottom right hand um, part of the slide, and you can see at the top it says exceptional for E, A for assistance, G for good, and D K for don't know. This was helpful in a conversation with the youth about employment. He said hey, Johnny, um, so have you thought about getting a job? Is that something that interests you? And if Johnny said, oh, I've already got a job, then Johnny's already identified that he's already gone down that road and knows a lot of information. So you might just validate what he already knows, which, of course, helps build his confidence, and then you might move to something else and say, well, what else would you like to talk about? And so this form, um, this assessment form, allows you to create a conversation but also find out from Johnny, yeah, he knows how to get a social insurance number or he knows how to fill out a job application. And so the middle column um, supports the worker to write down those pieces of information, which would be similar to a contact note. And if Johnny didn't know a lot about that, you could go to the third column and then that, would, uh, that living interdependently would then move you to another section of the binder that would be a resource guide um, for specific areas like how to, how to get your social insurance number, how to fill out a job application, how to, all the how-tos. And then the worker and the youth could work together on um, talking about what needs to be done and then assisting the youth to get that work done. Now, the worker could then use these pieces of paper from the binder as contact notes, but they could also photocopy it and give it to the youth um, to support them more as a reminder to, oh, yeah, this is what we talked about. <coughs> <coughs> now, we have found um, through all of the training that and, and all of the feedback we've received from those that we've done training with, uh, which has been the First Nations communities. We've done some work within the Ministry of Social Services with their youth unit. And youth are using it one-on-one -on -one with workers. Um, some of our communities have small youth groups with a facilitator. Some uh, career counselors or those that are in lifestyle classes uh, in grade 11 and 12, they're using it in the high school system. And then we also, we also have youth groups using it where not really a facilitator, but just someone that um, maybe organizes the room rental and, and the space. And they come in and they just provide the resource. And the youth take one section a week, and then they work through it themselves 
in small groups. And that has been very successful. So after the first year and a half of doing that work, um, we really found that we wanted to expand what the resource looked like, because we'd also gotten some feedback on how to improve the resource. But we also wanted to expand who we served with the resource, because at this point, We've got them in our First Nations communities. We've got them with the ministry. But we don't really have it, um, say, online or as an app product. So after doing the research um, of what would be kind of next, we determined that it would be a good idea to have the resource online. So we're currently going through a revision of the binder. And now, as each section gets revised, we are putting it on our website under the transition planning resources. And you can download them individually. And you can work through them with the youth. You can print them off. Um, they're not fillable uh, at this point, but they are on the website for you to download. This has been helpful um, because, again, you can scan after you've completed that conversation with the youth, you can scan it, put it in the youth electronic file. You can give the youth a copy of it. Um, and now the difference with the resource number two is that we added an additional section, uh, which was the community and transportation. So that was the only difference, as well as some improvements in the information. Now, resource, <coughs> resource number three, whoops, sorry, resource number three is the app. So as we did additional research and said, okay, what else can we do to expand those that could use this resource? After talking with youth groups and workers out there, we found that a lot of those we were talking to had a phone or some kind of device. So we developed an app. So we translated the information from the binder and the stuff that's online, the version 2, and we translated it to an app product. So it's called It's My Life. And that was named by some youth that we were working with. We actually worked with a group uh, in rural Saskatchewan who were in an entrepreneurship uh, class. And they had so many awesome ideas that we kept on going back to them, as well as other groups. But we went back to them quite a few times because they really had some keeners who were willing to uh, test the product and talk to us continually about what they thought uh, was important and maybe not as important. So throughout that process, we definitely learned a little bit more about who we serve. <clears throat> so that we've improved the sections. I mean, the market analysis for us was those that we're serving are young people, and they all have phones, or most of them have phones. Now, most of them are also Wi-Fi warriors because they don't have a data plan. But in their rural communities, um, they can get to somewhere like the health station or the school that might have free Wi-Fi. So the product seems to be um, working really well for them when they're in those Wi-Fi areas. Now, the, the way the the resources being used has shifted a little bit in the app versus when it was in the binder or the downloadable um, uh, feature. And mainly because the conversation isn't person to person anymore. And so now we find that the, the app or the product is very much led by the youth. It can still be a conversation tool, um, but it, it works a little bit differently now because you're not necessarily in front of youth having those ongoing conversations. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the details of the worker analytics, but I'll, I'll just mention now that we purchased the code when we developed the app because we found that there's lots of ways that we can repurpose this code, but we can also sell the code to um, another city group that might be working on this, say in Alberta or Ontario, or another First Nations community who says, I love the way this is laid out, but I just want to customize it with my own information. So if you're interested in that, please give us a shout. Now, the app is free to download. 
You can download it on Google Play or the Play Store, um, the Apple Store, sorry, and um, you just have to look up It's My Life. <clears throat> In, uh, on this slide, you'll see that all nine sections are being featured. So it's housing, money counts, employment, transportation, education, relationships and communication, uh, knowing your rights and the law, wellness, and community. And you can see each of them has a picture attached to them. Now we use the technology uh, with those that we developed it with, which was Push Interactions in Saskatoon, which are very similar to a Facebook platform as well as Instagram. So there's lots of swiping side to side and up and down because that's what young people like. Now the worker analytics. So I mentioned earlier that um, when we translated the information to an app product, uh, the conversation is a little bit different between the worker and the, the youth. So there is an opportunity to still have that conversation. So for example, if I was a worker, I could invite, with permission, a number of youth to also sign up with me, and um, then I could see, with their permission, everything that they have done. Now, I don't see the detail or personal information, say if they filled out a job application, because there are mock job applications, there's lots of lists they can fill out or information that they can collect for themselves, which will be maintained on their device. But through worker analytics, it will allow um, the youth to send a message to the worker to say, here, I actually worked on three of the sections in housing. And then next time the worker and the youth have a conversation, the worker can still use that information to follow up and say, so is there anything else you want to know about housing that I can help you with? But within each of the, the sections of the app, um, we don't have the assessment section anymore. We just have a section that talks about goals. And that's important for the youth to just think about, hey, if I'm thinking about housing, what is my goal with housing? Is it to find a place to live? Is it to find out how to keep my place uh, nice and clean? Is it to find out what a damage deposit means? So a lot of information is already embedded within the app. But those metrics are important because when we want to keep um, file data on what is Johnny doing, uh, you know, he's going to uh, age out of care in four months, you know, has he thought about going to school? Um, is he thinking of getting his own place? The worker analytics will allow um, the translation or the transmission of information to say, Johnny's actually been up on the app and these are all the sections that he looked through. Now there's no way for us to say how long Johnny stayed in each of those sections, but it will send you a note to say, yeah, Johnny went through these sections. So at least you have an indication as a worker that this information is somehow uh, being acknowledged by the youth. Now, practice challenges. Now, uh, using a device to work with clients is not something um, that is usual in our First Nations Child and Family Services, nor in the province. There might be some information back and forth uh, via text, but there certainly wouldn't be a lot of use of devices to, um, say, con to um, create contact notes that might be used in another way with the youth or the worker. So uh, I'm not saying that's not happening. It just wasn't happening a lot with youth in the same way that we were hoping with an app product. So. That has been a challenge for us because if you haven't uh, used uh, an app product or a device to do some of that casework, then we need to do more work with those that are using it uh, to understand kind of the, the advantages and disadvantages of using a device. So we created additional training for First Nations Child and Family Service frontline workers that are working with youth about safety using the internet and, and the app and devices 
in the work that they do. And that has shown to be very valuable in understanding the role that technology can have with youth. Youth are invested heavily in the use of technology, so this is another way to connect with them. Um, again, policies and procedures. We're still working within those policies and procedures, but they don't talk a lot about using uh, technology to share information, collect information with the client themselves. Access to smart devices and data plans. I mentioned earlier that um, a lot of our communities and our youth in the communities don't have data plans, and a lot of our adults don't have data plans, or in some um, places, uh, Wi-Fi or internet isn't consistent or it's not high speed. So those factors are important in development of the app. So there's actually a button you can have on the app that you can work on the app offline, and then when you hit a Wi-Fi area, it will actually sync and ask you if you still want to send the data to person A or person B. That has been very helpful in using the app as well. But um, you know, getting the infrastructure developed so that everyone has access to free Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi in certain areas, that's a bigger fish to fry. So we're working on that as, um, as part of the work we do here as well. Then we also have change management, which is a little bit of technophobia and documentation. This app, um, the binder, as well as the downloadable uh, sections have definitely improved documentation because you're already having those conversations. Uh, and then I talked a little bit about training capacity and support. Uh, it's been a pretty exciting um, project and resource for us, mainly because um, we saw the need out there for a resource, and now that the resource is out there and being used consistently, well, we're getting lots of feedback on its success. And that's exciting for us um, to see you know, what something um, that started off as an idea can then develop into a resource and now become something that workers are using ongoing with the youth that they work with. So, if you want more information on the app, uh, please look at our website. It has quite a bit of information on the app, which is sfnfci.ca. If you want to purchase the code, uh, please consider going onto our website and looking for my name and my email, and I'll try my best to get back to you on that. Uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter. It has a number of updates on the other resources that we're developing specifically for youth, but also for others that are working with um, children and families. And um, yeah, we have lots of free resources. I encourage you to go to the website and take a peek. Well, thank you. That was very quick, and I hope uh, you all learned a little bit more about uh, a resource that we're very proud of and very interested in more people learning more about and downloading for free and using. Thank you. Thanks so much for your excellent presentation, Shelley. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the audience is, is keen to uh, get to some questions. For those of you out in the audience, uh, please don't hesitate to send in some questions now. Uh, we have uh, some that have come in, so we will uh, get to them. Uh, but to uh, start off, uh, the first question um, that I have is, at what point would you start using this tool with youth? That's a really good question. When, when we were working with the youth and all those that are working with youth, um, that came up quite a bit on, you know, do you start six months before, do you start eight months before? And there was no prescribed time to do this. It was more about the readiness of the youth. And for some people, it was about age. So, you know, if you're six months from uh, aging out of care, that's probably a good idea. For some, that might coincide with, you know, around Christmas time if you're going to graduate grade 12 that year. And for others, uh, at the table, they said, you know, if a, kid, if a young person comes into care at 14 or 15, you should be talking about 
these skills because a lot of them are life skills. And if this is one way that all these skills are packaged, then youth should be going through it and just seeing what interests them. And that was the big trans translation from the binder or the online resource to the app is it became very youth-led in the app to what are they interested in. So each of the sections is quite large. So if they were interested in housing, they could spend an hour going through all the housing pieces. Um, and that might not interest them until two months before they're aging out, or it might interest them when they're 15 or 16. So no prescribed age. It's really a conversation on when are you ready to have those conversations, and when is the urgency that um, you're going to be leaving care. Right. Yes. Thank you. Um, another question uh, that we have is, could you tell us a little bit more about the tools that are on the app? Um, you mentioned mock job applications, but are there other tools for youth to practice with that would be on the app? Absolutely. Each section has multiple tools. Now, we, we weren't interested in reinventing the wheel. A lot of amazing work has already been done out there. So we connected with a lot of those organizations that have already created those resources. So in some places, we've created some, um, say, templates for you to fill out with the youth. But in most circumstances, you're looking through there and seeing that there are job banks already developed, that there are already organizations specifically doing, say, uh, entrepreneurship work, or they're specifically connected to finding you a home to live in. So those are the ones that we connected with and said, can we put you on the app so that you can be a connection for that youth? And they were all um, very helpful in contributing to the app. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so it's making those connections that becomes really important. Oh, certainly. I mean, we're a service provider of training and professional development, but we don't provide housing services. So we want to connect the youth to who in Saskatchewan provides housing services, who in Saskatchewan knows about jobs in your area. We don't provide those services, but we provide the connection to those services. Um, a question about privacy concerns. Um, could any personal information be compromised? For example, if someone loses their phone, um, is there a concern about uh, privacy? And you might have alluded to it a bit, but perhaps you could expand a little bit on that one. Okay. There is no personal information being shared <clears throat> because the information that is, say, synced when they come into a Wi-Fi area um, so if I was a worker and I signed up Johnny, I wouldn't sign up Johnny. I might call Johnny youth number one or youth number two, or I might give him another name. So there's no personal information that's being shared within the app. Now, if Johnny filled out um, a resume, let's say he took the template and he developed a resume using the template, he would have to save that and then send it separately via email or however to the worker or to whoever he wants to. But that information is not stored on the app because it's a template, so it's actually a separate document. We were very particular on that because with, with the confidentiality being the utmost important in the work that we all do, we wanted to ensure that um, that was an easier one for us to work with, especially for, for the youth as well as the worker. So there would have to be another line of communication outside the app if you were sharing personal information. <clears throat> okay, so it sounds like you did go through quite a process to ensure that those concerns would be addressed. Oh, absolutely. And we consulted a lawyer, we consulted, you know, the, the, org the business that we... Um, hired to develop the app, like we developed the content, they developed all the coding. We went through all that with them. And I must say we're still working out a few kinks, but the, one of the kinks is not con confidentiality. <clears throat> yeah. Good, great. 
Um, another question is related to um, the response of social workers. So the question is, how are social workers responding to this so far? Is it easy to bring data into case notes? Or are there functions like that to support practice? So far, um, we've had an excellent response. Um, those that were, because I think it's been a progressive development, so when we started with the binder, you know, and they would um, put their contact notes in the middle column, then they could scan them or they could give them to someone to type out, that that was, that was easy documentation. So as we move to the next version and the next version, we had lots of input into, so how could that work in your current system? And for First Nations, uh, each of them may run a system independent of one another, so it's not like it would go on a system and everybody would be able to see it throughout Saskatchewan, but rather you'd be able to see it within your own agency. And so that scanning feature was very helpful, or like I say, you could take the information um, and, and have it typed out. Because they would get, they would be able to download it and they'd be able to, to, um, to translate it, say, to a Word document. Okay. Yeah, okay. or they could clip and paste and paste it into their current um, data management system so that it's, they don't have to reinvent it every time, right? And I right. know some workers have clipped and pasted or clip and pasted it out and that's worked for them. Okay. Um, so uh, another question uh, about the, uh, the app. Uh, when was it released? The app, re the app was released um, October 1st of this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, it's fairly new. Do you have any idea how many youth are using it? Can you keep track of that kind of information? We do have analytics, but okay. um, we don't have up-to-date analytics because okay. we changed, after we had um, brought it up to the store, we changed one little piece, and so our analytics aren't as clean as we'd like them to be at this point okay. in time. Um, that's going to take us a little bit more time to figure that out. That, this part is very new to us because we're managing data, we're managing an app, but we're also managing those analytics. Now just from the training that we're, we've done and that we continue to do, we know that most of our First Nations that we've been to have downloaded the app and are using it. There are still many who are using um, the binder because of their access to Wi-Fi. So they may not be able to download, say, the sections from our website, so some people still like that binder format. Some people have moved to downloading online, and then others who have access to that um, high-speed internet or Wi-Fi have gone to the app feature. I'm sure it'll it'll be interesting over time to uh, kind of look at, you know, kind of what is the complement of those using, uh, yeah. you know, kind of face-to-face -face interactions as opposed to the app. Right? That would be interesting. Uh, we're, very, we're, we're very excited to hear uh, or to look at the stats and say, okay, like where are people downloading it from? You know, are they all from Saskatchewan? Uh, what parts of Saskatchewan? Are they youth? Are they adults? Um, there's so much we're excited to see. And it is still very new um, on the stores, so we don't have all those details yet. Um, another question that's related to um, the uh, staff who are who are using the technology, uh, because um, it was youth driven in uh, development, has it been challenging for some of the staff to use the technology? Have you found that or or not? Yeah. Well, that's why we developed the training. Yeah. Youth need youth don't need any training. They're so curious and it's definitely part of, you know, the culture that they're growing up in that they can use multiple apps 
without a lot of direction. And because we use the same kinds of features as, say, Facebook and Instagram, which are two of the popular um, ones out there, it's very simple for youth, youth to, you know, to swipe sideways, to swipe up and down. For workers, we found when we did our research that many of them had experience using a banking app or mm -hmm. Facebook, but they hadn't had a lot of experiences using, um, one, a device, and two, an app uh, to do their work with, with a client. So that's why we developed the training, because we felt that uh, we have to somehow bridge the gap here and it gives us an opportunity to better understand what more does a worker need or, or support in order to get to that place. Now we're also doing uh, research with the youth because it's exciting to hear what their feedback is and how can we improve the work that we're doing. And so another, another piece that has come up uh, in the last six, seven months is that we have one slide on entrepreneurship with youth but youth really are interested in more information using an app about youth entrepreneurship. So we've currently got a group of people together, including youth, who are working on that app. So we're, we're seeing spin-offs of information. And as you go into the app, you'll see the housing section is, I think, 180 slides. Like there's 14 different sections to go into, and each of those sections have almost their own section. So in time, this might, uh, as it rolls out, it might turn into their own apps, which uh, that's so far ahead right now. We're not thinking like that yet, but there has been some ideas out there, and that's how the entrepreneurship idea came about. So that's why we thought, well, let's try one of the ideas and see where we can go with it. And there has been an excellent response. That's great. Yes, um, certainly, as you say, you're opening lots of lots of doors and lots of possibilities. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And and when we looked at what was out there for our Aboriginal youth, that was culturally relevant, but also spoke to them as rural residents, there was very little. So that's what seems to um, speak to the youth when they use the app is the understanding that. They don't know everything that goes on in the city. They don't know about um, damage deposits. They don't know about having references. A lot of these experiences are new and, and can be translated to many different kids, not just First Nations kids. But when you're going from a rural to an urban environment, or maybe some that are already in the urban environment, these are very new experiences that maybe we're not having conversations about very often. So the app allows or supports that information and that sharing of information with the youth. Okay, thanks, Shelley. Another question um, is, can you be a little clearer on how the app works with regards to how the information gets uploaded to the worker? Okay. So Clarify that a little bit, yeah. Okay, so I'll go back to the, six, the 18th slide. So what happens is, is the worker signs up and creates an account and then can invite a youth. Um, so Shelley can create an account and I can invite Karen. And then Karen um, signs up as well and then we agree to share information. Now this is only information that pertains to the app and within the app. So if um, Karen went through a number of sections in employment. All that would come back to me is almost like a spreadsheet that said, here are six sections in employment, that, and they would all have check marks indicating that Karen went up to them. So that's what the worker would receive, almost like a chart or a spreadsheet and it would be a check mark to say that you went up to those sections. So it doesn't say Karen went to this section and did A, B, and C, and this is what they did, like filled out uh, a rental form or filled out an application for social insurance number. We found that that would be personal information and we wanted to um, 
do. We wanted to respect confidentiality and the sharing of information, but we also talked to workers about what do you really need to know in order to have a conversation with Karen. Well, what they need to know is what is Karen doing on the app? So that's why we provide the general information that says to Shelley, the worker, oh, look at on, you know, Karen has gone through five sections in housing, and these are the sections she went through. So again, continuing with that idea of that's what I can have a conversation with Karen about next time. So that's how we eliminate financial information, is just by providing a chart of the sections that you went to. Okay, so then it, you know, it's, it's not a total replacement for face-to-face -face discussion, right? Absolutely or, not. No, yeah. it was still clear from workers and youth that they want to have conversations they want to have that validation that they're they're having uh, that they're thinking about this that they have support to go forward with a with a decision that was still very genuine. This is just another way um, to see what Karen is doing when she goes up onto the app and sharing information, but very you know scratching the surface information. Now maybe in time that will shift or further develop, but up to this point. We definitely um, have kept it to just a checkbox to say, yeah, Karen went through this section, Karen went through that section, and then me, Shelley, the worker, can say, oh, Karen, I noticed that you went through um, finding a place to live or learning how to get a reference. Do you have any questions about that? Can I help you get a reference? Who do you think a, refer a good reference would be for you? Things like that. Okay. Um, another question. Um that came in is um, it's a it's an interesting overlap between technology and the social work profession. What what you've uh, what you've done here? Uh, were you in touch or did you um, connect with other uh, regions or municipalities or jurisdictions as you develop? Uh, the app and uh, and you know since it's been released. So when you were developing or since it's been released, have you connected with others who have perhaps done something similar? Okay, so when we did our lit review and we do a literature and knowledge review by talking to people because we notice that there's lots of great work being done out there, but it's maybe not on the web or maybe the people we're talking to don't know about that. So um, we, we went far and wide across Canada and even into the States, and we did not find any apps spe specific to the work that we were doing, which was kind of like the life skills piece, but, but um, geared towards First Nations youth and um, having that cultural relevance as well as that rural piece. So we didn't find anything comparable. Um, and since we've developed it, we've done a few presentations, and absolutely there is interest out there to, to purchase the code because they wanted to customize it to, to meet the needs of the youth in their particular geographic area, and so they're interested in purchasing it so that they can um, you know, put all their detailed information in there so it can be a resource for their youth. So nothing yet. We continue to look around. Um, but you know, our intention was never to reinvent the wheel. It was really to uh, continue to develop our resource and those we serve, but also expand who we serve. So um, well, it's been exciting, but we haven't had anybody come forward and said, hey, I've seen one of those before. Okay. <laughs> so certainly a leader in, uh, in kind of merging these two uh, professions. Um, hmm. Without it's being able... Uh, without having a look at the app, um, the question is, has the language uh, been adjusted to support youth who perhaps have uh, some challenges around comprehension, you know, that type of, uh, you know, using language that is understandable for, for anyone? Or perhaps, yeah, I guess. That's a good question. 
So plain language is used in the development of the resource. Um, I mean, youth reviewed the document or the resource multiple times, multiple youth, and uh, we tried to use the plain language approach in everything that we did. And I'm assuming we haven't had any feedback. We do have a feedback feature, and we haven't had any feedback on that specific uh, area. But that doesn't mean that it, it could potentially be an issue out there. It just hasn't been something that's uh, been brought up for us. We know from doing some work that this re is good for many youth out there but not youth who may be involved, say, with uh, CLSD. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's a gap that's out there and um, that probably isn't fulfilled by this resource. <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's something that we've done using plain language. Shelley, you talked about um, the rural and urban differences. Um, are there any other bridges such as rural, urban ones that you think this app might help bridge? Hmm. Yeah, it, it could be, um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm sure there's there are bridges that are out there that it's helping with understanding. So for example, um, for a lot of our youth who haven't had, and a lot of youth, urban or rural, haven't had an experience of having to find a place to live and get a reference and even get a, a reference for a job, because those aren't really the realities in many of our First Nations communities. So um, much of the information in the app is talking about how you'd go about doing that. And I think that is bridging that understanding of that bigger world out there beyond maybe a, a smaller rural environment. But you know, I haven't thought a lot about that, so that's, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm sure that'll come up in time, uh, is understanding the benefits or how it has um, helped young people in, or even the workers uh, bridge other gaps. Yeah. Um, another question that we have is, um, whether there's any sections that address the needs of LGBTQ2S uh, youth in terms of community and resources or sexual and physical health and housing. Um, there are, again, we, we do not develop those resources directly, but we um, have contacted, say, housing in Saskatoon, um, housing in PA, housing in the smaller communities, and we've provided links to them. Now, whether they specifically serviced or have programs um, directed or open to LGBT, I don't know specifically. We do have some um, talk about LGBT um, in the relationship area and in the community area, but it's not something that we talk, that an entire section or an area has been, um, has been given. Not something that came up uh, when we were talking with youth and the workers that warranted, say, more information that's currently in the binder or in the resource. But again, I think as the resource is being used out there and we get more feedback, that might be something that um, comes forth and people are saying, yeah, you know, you should have more about this and then we can do some, um, some work in those areas and add to the information in the app. So thanks for that. That's a really good suggestion. Um, a question about, um, um, again, about the app. Lots of interest in the, in the app from the questions that are coming in. Uh, oh, good. Can the app be customized uh, with information, uh, you know, of course, related to uh, another province? Uh, absolutely. And, okay. Yeah, absolutely. 
So if you look through the app and you like the format, right, on how, um, how the pictures are placed, how the, the text is developed, um, really we own the code for that. So you could put your own pictures in there, you could put your own information in there, and really the coding is the part that costs a lot of money uh, to develop the app. So that's why we're selling um, the code so that people don't have to spend the money to develop it from scratch, but rather just input your own content. So if you have other regions, purchase the code? Uh, no, but we're in talks with a couple of other, um, I'll call them customers, I guess, uh, to, to purchase the code. And we're quite excited about that because our goal is to expand who we serve. And if this resource helps people do better work, more work with youth, and it helps youth understand or informs them to make decisions, that's what we're excited about. Okay. Is there um, another question? Is whether a youth can share their information with another youth? And I'm, and I'm, um, it, you know, it's not clear what type of information, but is there the ability to uh, connect with um, uh, other youth through, through the, the app? app? Yeah. Not through the app. No. I mean, if you if you uh, have information on your device then you know you can screenshot it, you can text it to someone else. That would be your choice because it's your device. But there's no features currently that shares information from say youth to youth or someone else. There was in the development uh, some interest in kind of like an, um, I, I want to say kind of like a helpline, you know, where the youth could ask questions like, I'm moving to Saskatoon. Does anybody, you know, know where I sh where where I should start looking for a place to live? And we thought that through. We did some research, and we thought we're not ready to have that kind of resource within the app because then someone has to um, be staffed to respond to that person and be very knowledgeable about what that could look like. So. Those were the features, you know, kind of like the conversations between youth, the kind of helpline. Uh, those were features we decided not to go with for this first version of the app because we knew that we couldn't resource it. Yeah. Okay, we're, I just have time for one more, one more question, and it's kind of two parts, um, but related to the, the code and purchase. Uh, one is how much is the cost, and then the second part of that is, is there any limit then on the number of um, of people who might use the app? How many youth might use the app once the code is purchased? Sorry, I got your first question, and then you were in and out on your second question. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yep. How much is the code to yep. purchase? Yep. And then is there um, a maximum usage, number of youth that could use it once it's purchased? Or is it, you know, anyone um, can, can use it? Right. Okay. So uh, how much is the code? It depends. There's a couple of different ways that you can purchase the code. So that would require a bigger conversation with our organization because uh, there's a number of ways that you can purchase the code. The second part is anyone can use it. There's no maximum uses or maximum use that can use it. Um, you know, there could be, just like any other app, there could be 100,000 downloads and we could have 100,000 youth using it. And, and well, we don't distinguish in there about youth and work. You see, you know, if you go up into the store, it'll say, oh, 200,000 downloads. Um, you as a user wouldn't be able to see who actually downloads, but us in our analytics may be able to see, you know, that out of the 100,000, 75,000 were youth and 25,000 were workers or adults. So anyone can use it. There's no limit to that. And if they're interested in the code cost, they should give us a call or email us, 
and then we can discuss the different ways to purchase the code. And the reason that has a different price point is because it depends how much um, customization you want to have done on the code. That, that makes a big difference. Okay, well thank you so much. There's some um, information on the um, webinar site with a, a link or information about your website, Shelley, for uh, people to get a hold of you if they're interested in following up. So unfortunately, we're out of time, and I have to say another uh, thank you, Shelley, for your excellent presentation and for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. And thank you also to the audience for your questions and uh, attention. Uh, take care, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Bye for now.